Now, this is not going to come as a shocking confession to anyone in church tonight, but the virtue that most of us, myself included, have the most problem with seems to be humility. In fact, it seems kind of like a cruel cosmic joke that any priest anywhere has to get up and preach on something, which seems to be something easier to recognize than it is to describe. I struggle with humility, not just because the old Adam is always at war with the new Christ inside my soul, but because I often wonder, what is humility supposed to look like in any given situation? I mean, we've all met people who, at first glance, we thought, wow, that person is really humble. And then it turned out that they were a total fake, a complete fraud, and weren't really humble at all. I mean, how can we as human beings be humble? St. Irenaeus stated that the glory of God is man alive. The angels themselves bow before a soul in the state of grace. By our baptism, we are made children of God and heirs to heaven. We are priest, prophet, and king. That means that we're all pretty awesome. So what does it mean to be humble when God has made and remade us just this great. If we are the image and likeness of God, then how does that square with this image of humility that sometimes I have in my mind, that I need to be a fatalistic doormat and let people use and abuse me and just shut up and take it? Have you ever thought of humility like that? I don't know, maybe I'm the only one, but... C.S. Lewis was the one who really started me thinking about this in another way when he wrote, Humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. I'm going to say that one more time. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. I can affirm with all truth that I am fearfully and wonderfully made as a work of the Lord. But that doesn't mean that I spend my whole life contemplating that fact and demanding that others treat me like that. It means that because I know who I am, I can be comfortable in my own skin as a human being redeemed by God. And I can spend my time thinking of others and their needs. Well, at least in theory, right? It sounds so easy. But it isn't always, is it? St. Thomas Aquinas reminds us that without the virtue of humility, there can be no other virtue. There is no salvation. If we are missing out on this one important thing, it's like a house which was built without a foundation. You know, give it time, and the whole house, it doesn't matter how beautiful or how well constructed it is, it will disappear into the earth as if it never existed. When I was in the seminary, I went often to pray at the tomb of the only non-pope to be buried in the crypt of St. Peter's Basilica. Raphael Mary del Val was the son of a Spanish diplomat and a countess, was raised in England where he was unmistakably the most gifted person in any group he happened to be in. He was just one of those people. He was the platonic form of overachiever. He was that guy that everybody liked to hate because he was just so good at everything, no matter what everything was. When he revealed to his parents that 
He felt called to the priesthood. They were Catholic enough to thank God for his vocation, but they were also worldly enough to try to convince the Pope to make him a prince of the church on his first day of the seminary, right? And you know what? They pretty much got their wish. All Raphael wanted to do his whole life was to be a simple parish priest. There was one day when he was barely 20 years old, He was studying his room at the Scots College in Rome. There was a knock on the door. A Vatican diplomat burst into his room, Monsignor. And he's like, what, Monsignor? What are you talking about? No, you. What? I'm 20. That's impossible. He was sent to England at the age of 20 as papal legate to the anniversary celebrations of Queen Victoria. And not surprisingly, he was such a paragon of grace virtue and diplomacy, that he was drafted into the Vatican's diplomatic service and spent the rest of his life at the levers of power in the Holy See. But none of that ever changed him. He spent his days in the world of princes and ambassadors, prelates and administrators, and his evenings playing with and teaching the orphaned boys of Trastevere in Rome. When St. Pius X became Pope in 1903, he chose Raphael as his Secretary of State and Cardinal at the tender age of 38. It's really incredible. The two men couldn't have been more different. Pius X really was a country bumpkin from the Veneto region of Italy. He was a simple parish priest, and he never changed all that much, even when he was a bishop. Raphael was the quintessential English gentleman, with a little bit of a continental flair to him. And the two became inseparable because they had one incredible virtue in common, humility. Every morning, Pope Pius X would wake up to celebrate Mass, and Raphael would serve Mass for him. And then Raphael would go to say Mass, and the Pope would serve Mass for him. Absolutely incredible. This great cardinal wrote a prayer that I came across many years ago. I've been fascinated with with it ever since. And so I want to read it to you now. O Jesus meek and humble of heart, hear me. From the desire of being esteemed, deliver me, Jesus. From the desire of being loved, deliver me, Jesus. From the desire of being extolled, deliver me, Jesus. From the desire of being honored, deliver me, Jesus. From the desire of being praised, deliver me, Jesus. From the desire of being preferred to others, deliver me, Jesus. From the desire of being consulted, deliver me, Jesus. From the desire of being approved, deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of being humiliated, deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of being despised, deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of suffering rebukes, Deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of being calumniated, deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of being forgotten, deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of being ridiculed, deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of being wronged, deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of being suspected, deliver me, Jesus. That others may be loved more than I, Jesus, grant me the grace to desire it. That others may be esteemed more than I, Jesus, grant me the grace to desire it. That in the opinion of the world, others may increase and I may decrease, Jesus, grant me the grace to desire it. That others may be chosen and I set aside, Jesus, grant me the grace to desire it that others may be praised and I unnoticed. Jesus, grant me the grace to desire it. That others may be preferred to me in everything. Jesus, 
grant me the grace to desire it, that others may become holier than I, provided that I may become as holy as I should. Jesus, grant me the grace to desire it. I say I was fascinated by this prayer because it was years before I could ever get those words out of my mouth. I still don't think I pray it very well. Sometimes I wonder if I'm going to be struck by lightning for even attempting it. But even if I have not actually become more humble as a result of praying this litany, I can say that I am beginning to understand more what humility is supposed to look like in the situations in which I find myself. The ordinary day-to-day ones, and those extraordinary ones that come out of nowhere and throw me off. What I'm discovering is that true humility is what gives us a profound freedom. Humility is more than anything else the acceptance of what is, the courage to live in the real. So often we desperately want anything other than what we have, whether it be in terms of personal relationships physical goods, or even our own reputation. We may not be spending our lives on an illusion, but our desires are so focused on that illusion that we miss what is right in front of us. Not that there's anything wrong with desire, but we forget that sometimes we desire something that may be good in and of itself, but is not real for us at that time. And we waste ourselves in the futile attempt to make real what is not. We also have a tendency to be paralyzed, or at least hampered, by fear. We make endless calculations. We know what if I do this, then this will happen, and then that will affect that, and just go on and on and on. And we let ourselves be trapped by fear. In the Litany of Humility, we pray that Jesus deliver us from the desire to flee the acceptance of the real, to deliver us from those fears which keep us back from being authentically ourselves in that reality. And then we pray to Jesus to give us the grace to desire the good of others above our own. Not that He not give us what is good for us, but that he grant others what is good. The message of the litany of humility is not exactly the same message that the world gives us. The world tells us, I'm okay, you're okay, and that our self-fulfillment comes by getting as much of what we desire as we want. But the reality is that we are not okay. We've all been wounded by sin, by the original sin of our original parents, by our own sin, and by the sins of others. People like to say, you know, the first step to getting help is admitting you have a problem. The first step to authentic happiness and freedom is by recognizing ourselves for what we are. Glorious creatures, willed by God, who sometimes mess up our own lives and the lives of others. And then we seek to grow towards love, one step of humility at a time.